I wanted to know um, what's the most influential advice you received as a junior scientist? So before you set up your own lab. I, I think the most influential uh, advice is really the understanding of the three key ingredients for success. Um, so when you are in graduate school, you, you, you are trained to do, be a good scientist and how to design experiments, make sure you have the controls, make sure you do all the right things. Um, but then when you start your own lab, that can only take you this far, so far. What you, the other components that are key is that you have to be able to communicate your results effectively, either in meetings and conferences and publications. That's the only way your, your, your findings can have meaning. Secondly, is that you have to attract your own funding. So if you don't have your own funding, you cannot claim to be truly independent uh, because the person that is funding the project owns the project. And so it's important to start early and to write grants and you have to start small, they're competitive and, and, and then and make a progress as you go along as you gain the experience and expertise and you generate more data, then you go for much, much bigger grants. So that is, a, key advice that I would also give to people who are just starting their own groups that besides just being a good scientist, communication, how you communicate your results, how you articulate the findings and the importance of the findings uh, is very important. And then your ability to write grants and be awarded uh, funding is extremely important as well. Okay, um, thank you for highlighting the communication. Um, I have a question on that. So. Um, as scientists, we predominantly focus on communicating on, to other scientists um, in the platforms like conferences, journals, or just general meetings. And there's a lot of push now with um, public engagement and scientific public engagement to, ex to um, showcase our knowledge, not only to our scientific community, so the, but to the wider population, and particularly to groups or individuals that we conduct our research in, sorry. Um, so I wanted to know, are you active on academic Twitter or do you um, do any public engagement talks with the um, groups of individuals that you conduct some of the research on or is that you get samples from? Yeah, so that's, that's a very important question actually. And, uh, um, I think the, the, there's always a barrier in terms of our language, our scientific language, when we are communicating to our peers and, and, and the way which is not easily understood by the general public who are, are stakeholders in the things that we do. So it's extremely important that we learn to explain the importance of what we're doing uh, to you know the common people in the streets in terms of uh, the significance of what our findings are and what that all mean and, and, and how does that affect them and relate to them. Besides, that without their contribution and participating in our studies, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we do. So I'm um, a strong advocate for that. And, and, and in my, most in instances, when I do presentations, I always try to study my audience. I want to understand their level of understanding and I pitch my talk so that I can communicate to the people in the room and not just using words that just fly over everybody's head. And then the other thing is that uh, in, 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 in Durban, we have a, a community uh, advocate groups uh, that are associated with our cohorts that we do. So we have regular meetings, monthly meetings where we actually go to the community and the community leaders and communicate our findings, what we are doing, and if there's any new studies that we're planning, we go and talk to them about it. And you'll be amazed at how insightful they are in terms of the questions they ask. They ask very sharp questions and they actually do understand a lot of things that we do. And they are always very willing to participate and they know they are making a difference uh, by interacting with us. So it's extremely important. And I, but I feel that more could be done you know, we could have, you know, publications where we write some of our findings in, in, a, in a language that is widely 
understood by the, 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 the people in the community and the stakeholders like uh, government agent, uh, uh, people and other stakeholders so that at least they understand that we have visibility of the things that we do. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we just like a mysterious group of people that do strange things in the lab and people really don't know, you know, what we are up to. Okay, that's really great that you're actually involved in such um, scientific engagement communication. Um, then I also wanted to ask, what advice do you have for scientists um, in general who want to go back to conduct research in their own countries or scientists, for example, African scientists in the diaspora who would like to come back or go back to the continent and conduct research? All right, okay, that's another very important uh, question. Um, so it's never an easy decision to really pack your bags, especially if you've lived in these developed countries for many years and, and uh, you've lost touch and you pack your bags and you uproot your family and go back. Um, but having said that, there's a lot of unique advantages to doing that. Um, in that, especially if you are studying infectious diseases, TB, HIV, malaria, the problems are, the, are in the continent, are on the continent. The, 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 the problems are, are right there and, 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 and your, your, your research will have much more meaning if you do it closer to home. And secondly, is that, you know, places like here in Boston, in Cambridge, there's so many people are as good as you are, are trained, are knowledgeable. When you move to Africa, you have a much bigger footprint, so you can affect a lot more people and you, and particularly, I'm passionate about training of young cadre of scientists. And so, you, you come, you if you come to Africa, you have the opportunity to train students, you know, to get their PhDs and postdocs, and then you can create, you can contribute to creating a critical mass of scientists that can formulate the research on the continent that is directly relevant to the communities that you live and serve. Having said that. Um, uh, something positive is happening on the continent. I've gone to a lot of meetings in West Africa, in East Africa, in Southern Africa. The capacity is improving every day. You know, the sophistication is getting there. The infrastructure is there. People are writing grants and attracting a lot of funding. So it has changed quite a lot from like 10 years ago. And so if, yeah. if you want to come and be part of it, this is the right time to do it. Okay, no, that's great. Um, thank you so much, Zaza, for agreeing to be interviewed again and giving wonderful insight on your journey and the research that you conduct.